And we want to get started. And even though some will, will continue to join, and I want to introduce the people you really want to hear from, author Wendy Walker, class of 1985, and our interviewer moderator, uh, Sasha um, Osborne Breland, class of 01, who is the deputy chief medical examiner in Washington, D.C. So where this where the intersection of forensics and the investigation of crime overlap. Uh, we had a really fun pre-meeting, and I know the two of you are going to share a little bit about your background, and then you have a, a, a great conversation lined up for us. So take it away. Great. Do you want me to go first? Sure. <laughs> uh, sure. So um, thank you all for being here, and thank you to Ethel Walker for putting this together. Um, I, um, yeah, I uh, have been an author for many years. Uh, it's been my full-time job for about nine years. I have had a very sort of winding path to, to get to this place in my life, um, starting at Ethel Walker. And then I went to Brown University and worked um, in finance. I worked in M&A at Goldman Sachs for two years. And then I went to law school at Georgetown and then I was a corporate litigator and a stay-at-home mom and all sorts of things. Um, and then I, I started writing, um, gosh, my I think when my uh, oldest son was about a year old and he's going to be 26. So I started writing fiction, having no idea what I was doing um, about 25 years ago. Uh, and it took, was a very winding road. Um, I, uh, I practiced more law in between. And now I'm, this is where I eventually landed was writing psychological thrillers. And it's been, the learning curve um, has been pretty steep, both in terms of learning how to write fiction um, and also now writing novels that involve crime. And I rely very heavily on um, experts in different fields of um, forensic science, um, police work, uh, psychiatry, uh, and ev anything and everything else that, that comes up. Um, so I think the book that we're talking about is this one called What Remains. Um, this uh, came out in June. It's in paperback now. And um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the book later, but that's my path. I've, I've been, um, I had a, a uh, my first thriller came out in 2016 and I've been writing thrillers ever since. And this is thriller number five um and oh my gosh there's another one coming out in may uh and yeah it's been a, it's been a really uh really interesting and amazing career sasha do you want to say a little bit about your past yes. <laughs> good evening everyone i am sasha breland um walkers would know me as sasha osborne so graduated from Walker's in 2001, uh, went back to New Jersey to attend college at Montclair State University, where I did a combined uh, BSMD degree. So once I finished at Montclair, I went on to New Jersey Medical School and completed my doctorate in medicine. From there, I completed a four-year um, residency in clinical and anatomic pathology. And then I went down to Houston, Harris County Institute of Forensic Sciences, where I uh, completed a fellowship in forensic pathology. So that was in 2015 when I finished that fellowship. Um, from there, I went on to start my career at the Washington, D.C. Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, where I served as a deputy medical examiner. Responsibilities were performing autopsies, determining cause and manner of death, amongst other things. Did that for about six years, and then I was promoted in 2021 uh, to Deputy Chief Medical Examiner and Medical Director of the agency. And that's what I've been doing since. So that's, um, so we've had two totally different career paths, and um, and yet here we are, both alumna of, of Ethel Walker and um, it's it's always so uh, wonderful to see the different paths that that um, that young women take and become older women like myself and <laughs> uh, um, and that you know the sort of um, the confidence I think that that I got definitely um, at Walker's to uh, reinvent myself as many times as I felt like it and you know this is now my third or fourth career so. 
yeah. So do you want to kick it off? Do, we, should, do you want me to introduce the book and then we can talk um, about how the science plays into it? We'll start. I just wanted, so <laughs> fun, I'll start with a funny story. Uh, my best friend, Annette Humans is on. She was class of 2002. Um, and so I invited her last minute and I'm like, oh, should I dress up? I don't feel like it. I've been in a suit all day. I had court in West Virginia. I don't feel like dressing up. She's like, put on a nice shirt. So this is the shirt that I decided on. And the reason <laughs> is because it, to me, it's, it, it's um, pretty much exemplary, exemplary of what it is to be a Walker's woman. Um, and so for everyone that is a dial, I am a proud dial. So yay dials. Um, but you can see the suns are represented as well. So just to kind of <laughs> break the ice a little bit, get us started. Um, so Wendy, um, I read the book. It was an awesome book. Um, so I'll start with the first question of where do you come up with your ideas for books? Um, and more specifically, how did you generate the, the idea for this book? Yeah, so um, it's amazing. Like every every book uh, um, has, has had a different like starting point. And my fir very first thriller uh, was um, an idea that I uh, that came from reading an article in the New York Times about ten years before I started writing it. It was about memory science and how um, they were just starting to connect the dots between uh, PTSD and uh, medication that was given in in the field and in, in, in battle, like immediately, and how um, the interruption of the brain chemicals that are necessary to create memory um, could actually be uh, mitigate future PTSD. So soldiers who were given a great deal of morphine, like on or enough morphine right after sustaining an injury um, had less severe PTSD, um, you know, after um, years later than those who, who felt physical pain and had no pain relief um, right after the injury. And so it, it was it was basically talking about memory science and what if uh, we could um, apply these same principles to victims of um, crime and or also even to civilian accidents. And as a lawyer, I immediately thought, and a writer, I immediately thought, well, that, can you imagine having to make the decision of, um, of you know, in the moment of taking some sort of medication, whether it's the pain relief or whatever they end up coming up with to prevent yourself from having specific factual memories of a crime, but then weighing that against the fact that you may never be able to testify and, and see justice done, right, for this crime that was committed. And so that was, the, that was in my mind for 10 years, but I wasn't writing crime fiction. And when I finally, my agent suggested to me that I try to write a psychological thriller, I pulled that idea out. And then um, I just, you know, I, I was able to really um, work with that concept. So sometimes the ideas come from like a concept like that. And other times it'll be like a really cool scene. I'll think, wow, this would be such an intense scene in a book. Um, and I'll build a whole plot around that. Uh, sometimes it's a character, um, just a, like um, uh, a novel I wrote um, that uh, was in audio first and came out in print this year called American Girl. That book was just inspired by a character, actually first by a Tom Petty song, um, which always reminds me of my high school years, American Girl. And um, and that and just what it's like to be a 17 year old girl on the brink of adult life and everything in front of you. And then, you know, trying to capture that feeling. And so I then, I then built a plot for this, this um, character. But what remains, um, this is the story of a cold case detective who is just off duty. She's shopping for towels in a large department store when she hears shots fired. And, and her training sort of kicks in um, she's never fired her weapon in the line of duty. This is not the type of work she does. And she comes around the corner and she has her gun raised and and um, and she ends up taking the life of the shooter to save a man who's in the line of fire. And that man then becomes um, obsessed with her and it becomes this cat and mouse game as she tries to keep herself and her family safe. So this book, um, 
came about uh, from just driving around my kids and doing errands or whatever and listening to the news when there was a shooting in Boulder, Colorado. I don't know if anyone remembers that from many years ago. Um, it was in a like a, a large um, uh, supermarket, like a, a uh, I forget the name of it, but anyway, it was in it was in Boulder, and they the first people that were coming out of the store that were interviewed were witnesses who were unharmed. They had nobody left inside. They just had heard it and run and and had run out of the store for their lives and. And their voices, the trauma I could hear in their voices from having experienced this. Um, and then they disappeared, right? As soon as the media got their hands on the, you know, victims, families, and the shooters information and the police, all of these bystanders just, you know, they were no longer of, of interest. And I wondered what happened to them because they had clearly suffered a trauma. And so I decided to um to write about that and then plots just then you know you have to you start sort of seeing how deep you can go with that concept so i made it not just a bystander but someone actively involved in the shooting and then someone with the skills to, to sort of engage in this um in this sort of cat and mouse game who had you know detective skills and and it, and it went from there okay so you talked about trauma psychology, PTSD, um, real life events kind of influencing your writing um, with a focus on what happens to the victims, what happens to the suspects after these events occur. Um, how did you utilize all of this and, and start shaping the plot uh, for this story about Elise and Wade and, and their interactions after a, a significant life event? Yeah. So. Um... This is what this is sort of what what I love to um, to do is to dive into um, into psychology, and and so I started doing research on PTSD and just found these these two um, these two paths that I that I could sort of go down and combine in the book. So one is. Um, Elise Sutton, the the cold case detective, um, and I actually I'm so fortunate to have a local cold case detective who um, helps me with all of my books. But for this one, um, I, I had, it was, wasn't just like sending her crazy emails. Usually it's like a crazy email about, um, about something like if there was a crime and this happened and that happened, what would, and you know, I always get back like, LOL, like that's ridiculous, but <laughs> you know, this is what we would do. But this time I really needed a conversation with her because, um, she started talking about her work and what it is like to um, to sort of be on the periphery of a violent crime and how it sits with you and how and it, it was just it was so fascinating and I um, when I started really doing this research um, and seeing that there are these you know these like steps and they vary from you know different different books and whatever, but there are step, steps that you need to go through after a trauma to sort of get to recovery. So you start with, you know, just sort of like this shock and then there's denial and then there's, um, you know, you, you, you have to sort of make peace with it and accept it. And then you have to find a place to put it. So it's not, um, it's not in the forefront of your, of your thinking brain or your emotional brain every day, because the reality for all of us is that these things can happen where we, there can be, I mean, there was an earthquake in Connecticut. I don't know if those of you who are in Connecticut, um, there was an earthquake like in the, in our area. And I actually was in a, a doctor's office and the doctor said that was an earthquake. And I'm just like, no, it wasn't. We're in Connecticut. There aren't earthquakes here. But the reality is that things can happen, right? There are, we, we are vulnerable to, we we are, you know, vulnerable creatures um, to to external factors that are out of our control. And if we thought about those things every day, we would not leave our houses. We wouldn't we wouldn't be able to enjoy anything. We wouldn't be able to sit at a restaurant and just you know have a conversation. We would be looking at the door, looking out the window, wondering you know who that person was who walked in. We can't live that way. So we have to find ways when we when you actually experience a, a trauma. Um, it, it goes from being, and this is so fascinating. I'm sorry if I'm geeking out on this and I hope I'm getting it right. I'm Sasha's probably like, uh, that's not exactly right. But, 
but um but there's when it's and this is the example that I love um that that somebody um that somebody told me one of the psy psychologists I spoke to when if you learn that um that touching a hot stove will burn your hand by someone telling you that like you know your mother growing up or something like don't touch a hot stove you'll burn your hand that sits in your factual brain and you'll remember it and you probably won't touch a hot stove because it's kind of important information. It's not like you'll forget it, but it doesn't, you don't have an emotional reaction when you go to your stove and turn on the burner. It's just like, okay, it's hot, don't touch it. But if you learn that lesson by burning your hand and feeling pain, that will all be, that will be a lesson that's now in your emotional brain which is like a whole other creature. It's a, it's like a very um, unevolved part of our brain that, um, that wants to keep us safe. And it doesn't always listen to our factual brain. So you could be walking by a stove every time for the rest of your life and just feeling a little bit of a jolt because you learned that lesson through physical pain and it's in your emotional brain. And so with trauma, like a shooting, we all know that it can happen. We read about it. We, we hear about it. They, ha they happen all the time. I mean, the, the statistics are crazy. Um, but unless you experience it and, and feel, have the physical reaction to being in that situation, the fight or flight, you, you know, activation, um, the terror, all of that, so that it's now in your emotional brain. Um, it's a very different, um, it's a very different uh, sort of way of existing in, in your mind. So for Elise, when she experiences this firsthand, she has has to go through these stages in order to sort of get back to like a baseline for her emotional state. But she doesn't do that because she is riddled with guilt about whether or not she needed to pull the trigger. And until she finds out that yes, in fact, that man was in the line of fire, everything that she thinks she remembers actually happened. The shooter was going to kill him. She did need to take his life. She can't move past it. So she becomes obsessed with finding this man whose life she saved. And then the, the other piece of trauma that I found so interesting was this thing called uh, rescue worship. So the man whose life she saved, Wade Austin, he um, becomes obsessed with Elise because of this phenomenon known as rescue worship. And this I find so fascinating as well. When you, if you are in some sort of life-threatening situation, um, like being in a flood or a fire or a car accident, or someone saves your life in the way that it happens in the book, there, there's a way of sort of organizing that in your mind, which is that it was meant to be for some reason. So if someone saves your life, or if there's one person who's really sort of instrumental in the story of this event, that um, that can become your the story of this event. So it's not, it doesn't have to live inside you like random things can happen. Like this could happen again tomorrow. This, you know, I need to be afraid of this for the rest of my life because, you know, bad things happen. Instead, the narrative you can create is this was meant to be so that I could meet my rescuer, whether it's God or the universe or whatever it is that you believe in. It becomes this, this story that you tell yourself, but to believe that story, you have to maintain a connection with this person who rescued you because otherwise, you know, what was the point? So, um, so people who are rescued in these situations can become obsessed with their rescuers as a mechanism for processing their trauma. So those were the two like so really cool sort of paths about trauma psychology that I incorporated into the book. Okay. I'm sticking with this theme of trauma um, in psychology. I liked your analogy about the emotional versus the practical and factual brain and how it kind of guides us through various situations in life and how we respond. Um, so I'm curious, um, for those who read the book, you know, Elise, uh, like Wendy said, was in this situation and pretty much from the point of saving Wade until 
the end of the book, she, to me, makes a series of wrong decisions, I would call them. You're like, no, don't do that. Why are you doing that? Just tell your husband, just tell your partner. Um, and so I'm wondering if it was that, you know, her practical and emotional brain wasn't making that connection until it really started to affect her. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so one of the other things about um, about going through a trauma like this uh, is that if you don't have, um, if you if you weren't physically harmed, uh, people think that your reaction should be gratitude, um, that you should see everything as being brighter and bigger and more wonderful because you now know what it's like to come close to death, right? So you should just be so appreciative of everything in life, like, you know, just happier, everything, everything is just so much more um, significant and important to you. Um, and Elise, it goes beyond that because not only was she not harmed, but she's hailed a hero. Everyone is, you know, she gets a medal and her husband, um, and this was so much fun to write. She, the two significant people in her life that she should have told about this man who starts tormenting her. One is her husband and the other is her partner. But her, and so it was really um, interesting to me as a writer to uh, to sort of look for little, little like cracks in those relationships and how they might actually get bigger and give way under the weight of what has happened. So when Elise is feeling all of these things, like she's not feeling like a hero. She's, she is obsessed with worry that, that maybe she didn't need to shoot this man. And she is feeling panic and trauma from being in this store. Everything feels terrible to her. I mean, she has these two little girls she has to send off to school and, and her, her, her whole physical being is in fight or flight mode. It has not come down from that. And, so with her husband, um, he's had, he had an affair four years ago. So I gave them like a little crack in their marriage. Um, I think I refer to it as a, you know, a broken teacup that they've glued back together, but now they're seeing how much water it can actually hold. He does not get it. He's like, I, he does not understand why she can't sleep, why she's tormented by this, why she doesn't want her daughters to go to the medal ceremony. Um, and so she she disconnects from him and this is something uh this is something else that i read about um and that i found i really wanted to explore in the book about trauma like this is that the alienation that um bystanders like this can feel is really profound because no one no one understands if you had a physical injury like if you broke your arm and you had a cast everyone would understand if you said you were in pain or you didn't want to do your normal activities or if you were a little depressed because, you know, whatever your life has, you know, has sort of been impeded by this injury. It's something you can see, it's tangible. But um, a psychological injury isn't something that people can see. And so every no nobody really understands why you are feeling the way that you are and and not acting yourself and so the reaction to that can be a profound loneliness and resentment towards those people who don't understand you and then you start to retreat from them you you stop telling them how you're feeling you stop telling them what you're going through because they just don't they never understand and they want you to get past it can't you just get past it i mean i i think everyone on here probably has gone through something like this or knows somebody has a child or a relative or a friend who's had some, some sort of psychological or emotional um, issue that has, you know, really impacted their life. I, I don't think any of us go through life without, without witnessing it or experiencing it. And where someone will say, why can't you just get over it? Why can't you get over that guy who broke your heart? Or why can't you get over not getting into that college or why can't you get over being fired from your job just move past it get over it um you know in, unless we are inside the mind of the other person and understand all of the things that that their their individual psychology brings to bear we can't understand the why and this is true of uh, people who witness trauma and suffer from it in this way that's invisible 
so they so elise feels very, very alienated from her husband she stops really trusting him and wade is very clever and in, in sort of planting little clues that maybe he is uh has reignited this affair um and then with her partner rowan he was in the marines and he is kind of hardened to all of this so he um you know he's not um she she's not quite sure how much she can reach out to him and she's also feeling very protective of these people in her life so she goes into this little sort of cordoned off place in her mind where she and this man from the shooting are in their own like separate world because they they were the only ones who experienced the shooting and yeah she makes some questionable uh decisions um, but ultimately she has a plan, which we find out at the end. So hopefully by the end, you don't question her quite as much. There's sort of a little bit of method to her madness. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, in hearing some of the things you just said, some of the words that I just wrote down was hardened or get over it. Um, and it resonates with me because I'm in this field. So I don't, you know, directly experience the trauma myself, but I, uh, indirectly experience the trauma that I see what other people do to each other, basically, you know, every day I'm dealing with deceased bodies. And so I get kind of what's known as that vicarious trauma. Um, and so this resonates with me um, because you said, you know, Elise had to kind of alienate herself. Um, she became so hyper-focused and I didn't look at it as necessarily a negative because I felt like that's what she had to do to protect herself and her family, um, as we find out later in the book. And so, you know, in dealing with trauma every day, um, whether it be, you know, the forensic pathologist, the detectives and other law enforcement, or even Rowan, who was a Marine and saw people die, um, some of us develop, I call it a coping skill of detachment. Um, and it allows us to, one, do our jobs and do it well, because we don't get so emotionally attached to every case that we see. Um, and two, always also function um, outside work, you know, whether it be a wife, a husband, mother, daughter. Um, so I'm curious to 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 know what you think about um, that as a form of coping with trauma, the the detachment that some of us are forced to do on a regular basis. Yeah, and I'm so I and I want to hear more about how you do that. But I when I was um, interviewing the detective um, who helped me with this book, uh, the stories that she told me. Um, and the way that she explained uh, her emotional reaction to some of these cases was like nothing I've ever seen portrayed in any, anything, any TV shows, any cop shows, any, anything like just, it's, it's so um, visceral that the, um, and, and to do the job and for her, she said to detach um she had to sort of create a uh, sort of like, you know, very clear um, moral boundaries, good and bad. Like this is the victim and this is the horrible monster and I'm gonna catch the horrible monster and I'm on a mission. And some of her cases would go on for, you know, 10, 20 years. And sometimes she would catch up with that, the perpetrator and they, they would solve the case and it wasn't a monster. It was somebody who had, you know, done something in the heat of the moment or in, in the stupidity of youth and just never got caught and tried to carry on with life and had, you know, actually lived, you know, lived a really upstanding sort of life and had loved ones and children and spouses and all of those things. And, um, and she said it, it was always so hard for her to reconcile, you know, this horrible act with, um, you know, with, with this person who wasn't a monster. But I'm wondering, like, how much do you actually, do you ever follow up on your cases that are like crimes to see who, you know, like if you get a case and, um, you know, and maybe they haven't caught the person, um, do you, do you keep track of that? Like, do you, do you wonder, do you stay attached to that, like that, that loss of life and try to find closure with, with any of the, you know, factual um, things about it? So um, as part of my job, I do have to testify. So when they do find the suspect, um, I do have to testify. So in those cases, I keep in contact with both law enforcement and um, prosecutors. Um, but I limit 
And I have to limit the amount of time I spend on the cases after I'm finished with them. Until it's time to testify, I try not to think about the cases too much. Um, think about what was done to these people because, again, that's me coping. That's my detachment. Um, I'm looking at it as this is my job. I've done it. I've completed it. Now I have to move on. Because I think, because like I said, I deal with death every day. And if I, you know, we we get a lot of scary cases, um, you know, a lot of children and, and just horrible things that people do to each other. And so to, for me to sit and linger with it, um, I think I wouldn't be able to do this in, in for a long time. Um, so I look at every case. Like, how do you, how, what's your mechanism for doing that? I, I, I like so fascinated by, by that. Um, I think it's it's a mental. Um, it's just a, a mental decision, um, kind of like that moral road. Um, it is, I have a job to do. I'm serving this deceased person. I'm serving their family. I'm serving society. And I have to focus on making sure that I am documenting um, and relaying factual information. If I start to worry about you know, why this person did it to this person and et cetera, it becomes more emotional than factual for me. And so I just make a conscious decision at the beginning of every case, you know, this is the case in front of me. This is the information that either law enforcement or society needs. Um, and this is the information that I'm gonna provide them. Um, I don't know, um, maybe I always joke, maybe it's the Capricorn in me because I'm all about business. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's what I tell my friends and family, but it, it, it was a skill that I developed very early on um, in my career. Um, because I realized to get attached to cases, um, you would get burnt out so quickly. Um, and, and to do it well and to focus, um, you just kind of had to detach yourself from the situation, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. And then when you, um, I, I would imagine that there's, you know, being like having to testify and, um, and ha having that kind of pressure and kind of knowing um, you know, what's sort of, uh, how much weight, maybe not every time, but a lot of times I would imagine the, there's a lot of weight on your testimony, um, as mm -hmm. part, part of the, evidence in the case. Yeah. And it's funny because I have some colleagues, especially my younger colleagues who are uh, literally afraid or so anxious when they have to testify. Oh, I have to sit in front. The defendant is going to be there. They're going to be looking at me and da 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 how do you do it, Dr. Breland? And I'm just like, if you keep your eye on the prize, I say, you know you're there to testify. Why are you there to testify? You're not there to say that this specific person did it to this person. You're just saying how the decedent died, right? If you stay and focus on that um, and realize that you have no personal gain um, in any of it, um, it, it kind of keeps you focused. And so I'll walk into a courtroom and you know I'll see the defendant um, I've had some that stare me down. I've had others that smile and laugh through the trial. And so I can't, I just, you know, talk to the jury. I don't even pay attention to the defendant because then you'll get distracted or emotional. Um, and then you don't end up serving anyone, uh, appropriately when that happens. That is so like, that's sort of like the real life of the stuff that I write. I, it's so <laughs> fascinating. And I'm already like spinning plots. I'm like, what if somebody like, you know, found out and wanted to, you know, influence your testimony one way or another? Like, I mean, there's, yeah, it's, that's where my writer's brain goes, but um, that is, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, the, the, um, the immersion in, in that, um, in that world of, uh, of crime and also tragedy and loss uh, that, I, you know, fascinates me and it's what, what drew me to this book. Um, and I honestly, I don't know that I, I don't know that I could, could do that. <laughs> I, I have trouble detaching from my fiction. I, I like, you know, if I write a scene and that's, you know, in a house and it, it remotely resembles my house, like, I, you know, it, it's not good. So, um, yeah, but I think that's, it's that intersection, um, it, it is really fascinating. And I try, I try very hard to, uh, um, to bring some reality, um, into the books and make the characters somewhat realistic. And, um, and it, so it was such a gift to be able to work with this, with this detective. 
-hmm. And I really, I, I so admire what you, what you do. Thank you. Um, I will say that I, I am impressed with the, the level of, of factual information in your book as it relates to forensics. Um, anybody in this field, anytime we see any of those shows, CSI or Law and Order, and, and some of the stuff that they have in there, you're just like, where do they get this stuff from? Um, so I, I will say the stuff that you had in here was factual, close to what we do. So I'm curious as to what research into forensics did you do sp specifically? Yeah, so, well, thank you for that. And I will say like being a lawyer, I have the same reaction watching legal shows. And now occasionally when I write, I don't really write courtroom dramas, but if I have to write any scenes with lawyers, I find myself taking liberties and I'm like, oops, because it's actually really boring, you know, what goes on in a courtroom and, you know, and some of it is a lot, it's just not fun to, to watch. Uh, but um, yeah, so um, I do, I use Google a lot. And if I can't, if there's something I can't find um, on, you know, like with a lot of confirmation, like conflicting stuff, then I find experts. And in this case, again, relying on my um, cold case detective for a lot of the forensics, because that's what she does. And it's, it was, um, so that was fascinating. And then some, you know, the there's a whole second um, narration going on. It's maybe every few chapters, we are in a different time frame. We don't really know the time frame. We don't really know who is telling us the story but it involves this like hunting shelter, this, this very sort of nefarious like hunting shelter in the woods and they find, and it's a, there's an animal, a large animal cremation of it in, in, one, of these sh in one of these shelters and some hunters are like raking it out and they find human bones. And so I had to actually do some um, research on uh, cremation and that was really kind of gruesome. Um, but, and it also, foiled my plot a little bit because I, I won't go into detail, but I learned out, I learned it's not as simple as just throwing a body and turning a switch. And then there's just ash. There's not, it's not how it works. Um, and the things, you know, and actually it's, I mean, it, it was fascinating to me because, you know, that's how it's portrayed every time, you know, and, and when someone passes and is cremated and you get this neat little, you know, box of ashes and actually, you know, bones don't necessarily burn and lots of things that I had to deal with in this, in the book. But, um, some of the things that this, uh, detective was telling me about her cases, um, just was, it was fascinating. And she was a tremendous resource. Um, and the thing about, about, um, and well, the other thing in the book that where I was able to bring the foren forensic science in is that Elise was a forensic science, um, professor at a community college years before. And she, all of her materials are online and she's been updating them just, you know, as a service to the school, um, as she closes new cases and she'll, she'll put the cases up, um, in, you know, in the website for the college for this one class, um, uh, if it's an interesting case study. And so the man Wade, who's tormenting her has gained access to this, all of this information. And so he knows, almost everything she knows. And so she starts using all of these sort of things that um, that she's documented um, uh, against her and that sort of added to the plot. But it's it's always, I try very hard to rely on experts. And what's so, it's so interesting because at first um, I always get the, that's absurd kind of answer. Like what, that would <laughs> never happen. I'm like, I know, but just if it did. And then, and then they'll, you know, start to get into it. Like, oh, well, if you wanted to paralyze someone, but they're still awake and then, but they can't move like awake paralysis. And what if they did then? And, and I, I, like, I, I spoke to an anesthesiologist once about a book and he had like, he spun like three more plots for me involving all of the medicine he deals with as um, an anesthesiologist. And I was like, slow down, buddy. Like <laughs> you're a little carried away, a little too excited about these uh, crime plots. Um, so it can actually be um, very, very interesting to uh, to interface with professionals um, in all different fields and especially psychology. Um, that one actually, I feel like I've, you know, um, I've, I've written so many books now about, about um, that involve trauma, but also soci sociopathic illness um, and 
just so many so many dynamics relationship dynamics attachment issues and all of those things that um that i'm fairly well versed in a lot of them now um but when something specific comes up i just i always find somebody who will who's going to talk to me like yourself you're going to be on my list <laughs> <laughs> the next time i have a medical question so i'd be happy to i think most medical professionals are um, because when we see it on TV or in the movies and we're like, what are they, all they had to do was call a doctor and ask, like, would this work? Um, and most of us would either tell you no, or start, you know, helping you develop different storylines based on what we deal with on a regular. So, um, I always right. say people just, you know, you have Google, but you know people too. So why not ask? Um, <laughs> you, you yeah. just talked a little bit about the split Plot. Um, and I wonder if you can just delve without giving, you know, the book away for those who haven't read it, yeah. um, kind of just, just delve into how you kind of made it, make, made it work. Um, I know when I was reading it, because I think, like you said, it was like every few chapters, it flashed to, uh, the second plot. And I was like, when I started, I was like, okay, where's this going? And then halfway through, I'm like, oh, Wade did, you know, and it wasn't until maybe the second to last chapter that I actually made the whole connection. So I'm curious um, as to how you kind of came up with the idea of the split plot and then how you weaved it in so that it did work out in the end. Yeah, so the book actually started with, um, it started with this idea about for Elise Sutton, and the character. And then I combined it with a um, this, twist idea that had been floating around uh for a long time i won't say what it is because it will be a spoiler and i didn't i i didn't completely pull it off i had to adjust it because uh it was i had i had um two people read it my agent and another reader and they completely missed it and they're like wait why are there three bodies i'm like oh my gosh you missed the whole plot twist um and <laughs> So I, I revised it a little bit. And that's the thing. Sometimes these twists are really fun, but um, but the gymnastics you have to go through with the plot to pull them off. And then the reader, it can take away from the enjoyment of the book if you have to go back and rethink the entire book. So this is just a little like spice sprinkled onto the plot. Um, when you um because it's a because it's a different time frame and the so the investigation into the remains up in this shelter start to co so you start to see little facts um in that investigation that are that are coinciding with what's happening in real time when with elise who is you know this cat and mouse game is really stalking so wade is is like tormenting her he's trying to infiltrate her life and just let her know that he can get to her or her children or her partner at any time. And she's trying to figure out who he is so she can stop him. And so she's doing her own work and he is using um, techniques that he learned from her class to get into her house, to set up cameras at her children's school, to you know do all of these, these things that are um, incredibly, uh, you know, additionally dramatizing to her um so the split time frame is very matter of fact and it's just you know they're just trying to figure out who this body belongs to that's in the cremation oven and um and the ending of the book the end the end the end of both points of view come together and you find they're like a lock and key and all of a sudden one the, the lock the key undoes the lock and the whole plot fully opens up in like the last few chapters. It was, it was very fun to write. It required a lot of readers to make sure I wasn't giving too much away or, you know, making it not understandable at the end. And so hopefully it works, but that was very, as a writer like that to me is a lot of fun um, structurally to, to try to, you know, play with things like that. Was this the first time you incorporated that into one of your books, the split plot? Oh no, I've split, I use split time frames all the time. I love them. So, um, and I've had, I've had twists. I would say um, my, my favorite twist is in a novel called Emma in the Night. And that's really just a psychological twist. It's not a split time frame. It's just a very unreliable narrator, an 18 year old girl um, who's telling a story that's not completely true. And you don't really know why and how it's not true until the end. Um, and then the next two um, have split a split time frame. It's very fun to work with split time frames. 
um, especially when uh, the reader knows it's a split time frame because um, it just creates a sense of urgency. So I use this mechanism in two, two books where the reader knows it's 24 hours later or it's two weeks later. And you just want the person in the back time frame to catch up. I mean, you sort of want each, you know, whatever's going on in both, you're learning information. You just want them, you get, have this sense of like, just tell me, just catch up and, you know, find out, you know, what's going on, um, you know, in, in, in that, in the other storyline. Um, and that can be really fun, but it creates a very urgent, like read, like almost, you know, trying desperately to get to the end. This one, I don't think, this is, um, I think most of the suspense takes place in the primary story because you don't really know what, how the other story is, is fitting in. And so it's meant to create just more curiosity than a frantic, like, you know, um, feeling of, of needing to, to pull the two uh, points of view together. Okay. We have lots, lots of tricky twists that, that thriller writers use and they're, and now, like, now that I, you know, that, that I've been doing this for a while, I can spot most of them in books that I read from other authors, but, um, but, uh, but that doesn't mean they're not well done. It's just that there's, you know, there's kind of a finite number of ways to, to use these types of twists. Um, that they're, they're a lot of fun. Okay. Um, I want to kind of shift gears now um, because like I said, I think it's, it's a great book. Everyone should read it. I don't want to give too much away. Um, so in terms of being an author, um, what is it like to be an author full-time? You know, it's really, um, it's really, it's, it's, uh, it's great in a lot of ways. I, I started writing because I really wanted uh, the freedom to be with my kids. And when I started writing, there was really no internet. There was no work from home. There was no part-time work for lawyers um, that was, you know, worthwhile for the babysitting costs it would be, it would incur. And, um, and I was living out in the suburbs. So for me, like, you know, to do something meaningful um, and also, you know, really be a primary caregiver for my kids. Um, it, it was challenging. And I thought, well, what if I could, you know, what if I wrote a novel? What if I, be, you know, became a novelist? I had no idea how hard it would be. Um, and, and the skills, the tools that were necessary to write fiction, you know, you kind of think, whoa, I'm a lawyer. John Grisham's a lawyer. Ah, how hard can it be? And it's actually, it's actually a whole other set of, of skills that you need. Um, and maybe, maybe for some people switching careers like that, it's very intuitive and they can see how to use narration and dialogue and how to structure plot and all of that. But for me, there were some things that were not obvious and I got completely wrong. And so, um, uh, so it was a long road, but, uh, and when I finally broke, broke through, it was, it was like 17 years later after I first started, I had published novels that didn't do well. It, each stage in this business has been um, a learning, a, a very steep learning curve, not, not just writing a book, but then what happens after that? And then I got a publishing deal and I thought, oh, I'm done. Like, I'm, that's it. Now this is my career. And that's not how it works. Like you, you have to, you need to get paid well. You need to get uh, a decent advance. This is my personal experience. Um, so that you can live and that, and the publisher will put, will then be motivated to put enough marketing behind your book and print enough books. There's a whole, there's a whole like mechanism to selling books um, that, that publishers know. And that's why it's very hard uh, for independent publishers to sort of catch up to these, to the, the big five, because they just have they have boots on the ground all over the country and in, in independent bookstores and local branches of, you know, Barnes and Noble and, and sales reps that have these relationships and with libraries and, you know, you're, it, you can sell so many books online and you, there are viral sensations online, but most authors rely on their publisher to get their book into bookstores um, and into, you know, wherever books are sold and into the hands of readers, because there's only so much space on the internet for advertising. And, you know, you could, you could try to become a TikTok sensation or something like that, but very few of us, you know, are able to pull that off. So um, it's a tough business um, is what I will say. There's not a lot of job security. Uh, and 
Um, and so that is, you know, as I'm getting older now, I, I do think about that. I'm glad that I've achieved what I've achieved and I feel fairly secure that I will continue, you know, making a living, um, writing books and, and working with publishers. Uh, but I have seen, I've seen authors have, you know, 20 New York times, best selling books, and then their careers just, just sort of slip away. And um, it's it you it's you have to be really diligent in in staying um, you know staying where you are and and staying current and writing good books and having the best team and getting good deals. Um, and then on a daily basis, I know I'm making it sound terrible. Everyone's like, <laughs> so that sounds awful. Um, but the the joy of it is, you know, I am on my own schedule and I love being creative. I love coming up with new ideas. I love other authors. We have so much fun together when we see each other. Um, and then the, the other thing is it's, you know, it's like having your own business. So um, I am not very good about my work day when my youngest son went to college and my day was no longer like stopped at three o'clock. I became a complete workaholic. This was about a year and a half ago, like a complete workaholic. I did, I had no hobbies. I didn't know what to do with my time. Um, it, it, there was nothing making me stop. And yet I was so tired after writing straight for, you know, six hours um, in, in sitting in the same position. Um, and so this, this is what I'm working on now is trying to have um, to build in a work-life balance when all I can ever think about is finishing this this book that that has to get finished, um, so I can you know start on a new one or sell it or wherever I'm at, whatever stage I'm at. It's uh, it's like having your own business where you you feel like any time away from your desk is a lost opportunity. So it's it's challenging in that regard, but otherwise <laughs> otherwise I love it. <laughs> Well, you are smiling, and so you you must love it and must be treating you well. Um, I don't have any other questions, so if the audience has any questions, please feel free to either put it in the chat or come off mute and ask myself or Wendy anything that's on your mind. Yeah. Uh, was it Miss Johnson? Yeah. M. Johnson, yeah. yes. Yes, hi. I was wondering, um, Wendy, who was your English teacher at Ethel Walker? Did you have Gary Fountain? No, I had Mrs. Sunquist. Oh, you're kidding. No, I wow. loved her. Actually, yeah, the fact that I can remember her name after all these years. Um, uh, yes, I remember that class very well. It was, it was very, and actually, I recently found a box of memorabilia, and I found a journal that, um, that, that I kept in her creative writing class. And I kept it all these years. So, yeah. You did not have Mrs. Nelson? I did not. My my older sister did. She's a year ahead of me. She had Mrs. Nelson. Who did you have? I had both. I had uh, um, Mary Nell, Mrs. Nelson, and I had Gary Fountain. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I just had Mrs. Sunquist. But I was only there for two years. So I, I finished junior and senior year there. So gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And then I just had one other question. Um, I actually just finished a very disturbing book. It was What's I it felt called? as if I had PTSD from it. Um, Dreams of Joy by Lisa C. Oh, okay. I haven't read that. Yeah. I'm glad I read it. Um, we should all read it. It's a piece of history that I just, for some reason, I don't want to blame it on Ethel Walker, but I didn't, I wasn't aware. My son said, mom, the great leap forward. You studied that. And I was like, mm, no. Um, but aside from that, I mean, there are also books that traumatize the reader. Um, back to the uh, mechanics of making a living writing. Does, do you have an agent and do they help take the pressure off at all? Yes, you have. I, I mean, I, I don't think I could be in this business without an agent. It's, I think it's an essential component. They, they do more than just sell your book. I mean, they're in, they oversee everything and they are your advocate for absolutely everything. Um, 
and I've recently changed agents and am uh, writing a new book um, that he um, is hoping to take to, um, I'm out of contract now with my print publisher. So I'm hoping to uh, finish that and then see who's interested in it. Um, uh, but you know, he's amazing. And uh, I, you know, I've had wonderful representation just at different needs at different times. Uh, and I have TV and film agents and they do an incredible job for, they've placed all of my work with options. Nothing has gotten made yet, but I have three with current options that are um, at, you know, at various stages and trying to get incubated and, and, and greenlit. So you always see, I have 99% of books that get option don't get made. So we all know that going in, but there are, you know, occasionally they happen. Um, and um, no, but it's great. And actually I also write for Audible. Um, so I have a new Audible coming out on May 9th. Um, if anyone likes to listen to audiobooks, this is, uh, it's called Mad Love and it's really fun. It's partially scripted. It's like 50% scripted and it has a really great cast of actors, about 30 actors um, that you, you know, you probably recognize from some of your favorite shows. And um, and that's coming out May 9th, but he deals with all of that. My agent, like he puts that together and he's just, you know, on top of everything. That's great. Cause I know it is so complicated. One of my closest friends here in Locust Valley owns our local bookshop, um, uh, bookstore okay. and we support her in every way we can. In fact, I, I've waited for your book, this book so that I could get it from her. You know, so uh, none of us in this town order anything from Amazon. So um, uh, it's complicated. It's complicated, yes. but we're all trying. Yes, it is. It's, um, you know, authors would not, we would not make a living probably anymore without Amazon. That's just the reality of it. Um, because um, just where we're at in terms of the number of bookstores that are still around uh, the brick and mortars. So, um, but yes, I, I rely very heavily on my local bookstores and libraries, uh, for, for sales, for events, um, just for getting word of mouth and yeah, it's a tricky business that way. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any other, other questions? Yeah, I do. What, speaking of that, what do you think the future of you know, just writing books as you, you look now and people in their homes don't have books in their living rooms anymore. Everybody's watching uh, television. Everybody's online. And just you know, how many people say, gee, I read the best book and I, I want to sort of sit down and, and snuggle up with a book. I mean, I, I worry about this. Um, and being in your, the business that you're in, you probably should worry a little bit too, but you're doing it. And thank God for that. Bravo. And I think the book's wonderful. I've not finished it, but I've enjoyed reading it a lot and thank you for doing it. Thank you. Yeah, it's um I have to say I maybe because I'm in the book world, but um I feel like a lot of people are reading. Um I I think statistically there's a lot a lot of people are reading ebooks and maybe that's why we're not seeing so many books in print, which is a, another, you know, I think that's just where we're headed is, is yeah. digital. I mean, I actually, when I travel now, I have all my books on a Kindle. I'll bring one book. So if I'm, you know, in a sunny spot or at the beach, um, you know, it, and it's hard to read, but I, I think, um, I, I think people are still reading. I don't know. I, I, maybe that's delusional, but if you, you go on, it's interesting. Um, like TikTok, which is where there's a lot of, you know, young, young people um, and people in their twenties, uh, people of all ages really, but it's kind of the things that really go viral are, are tend to be younger um, people. And, and there's a whole community there and all they do is talk about books and they have made, they have been trend setting. So they, they made uh, this one author, Colleen Hoover, they, I mean, she had been written like 15 books and they made her uh, an instant celebrity and she sold, I don't even know how many books, um, a hundred million plus. I mean, it's just, it's been, she's been on the New York times bestseller list with four or five books for three plus years since COVID. Um, and now they're setting a trend with this new genre called romanticy. It's romantic fantasy. You would never see those books on the New York times bestseller list before um, because they just wouldn't be, you know, they wouldn't be taken seriously. They wouldn't be on in the front 
of you know literary works and bookstores and whatnot um um just because of you know bias i think toward anything that's romance driven uh but these books now if you go on the new york times bestseller list they're hardcover list there are probably anywhere from four to five romantic uh fantasy books on that list because of tiktok because of the community they're they're talking they're not just they're, they're talking. It's like a community of young people reading and talking about the characters, dying to get to the next book. When's the next one coming out in the series? So I see things like that. And I think maybe, maybe we'll be okay. I don't know. I could be in my own bubble. I think sometimes we're all in our own little bubbles. I don't know. Like these little fish bubbles. We don't really like, like watching the eclipse. I was thinking that, you know, like how many events like this are happening out in the universe we don't even know about so well i i'm going to chime in now with a thank you i know from all of us to the two of you for sharing your your evening and your your both of you are so passionate and curious in your professions i feel like you really exemplify what it means to be a walker's woman you're you have a lifelong passion for learning um and that's that's one of the the great privileges of being connected to this community and uh, I really have enjoyed listening to you. I, I'm i looking forward to sharing this recording with those who wanted to be here and, and couldn't be. Um, and, and as always, thank you for participating because I can get on and talk to these two. I did it last week, but it's fun to have our community come together in this way. And um, we are always looking for new ideas, both for our book talks and for our Walker's Women in the World series based on topics of interest. And please don't hesitate to reach out to me with any suggestions or ideas. Um, I like to pursue those. I only know what I know. Um, so all of us in the advancement office like to hear about what's going on that we might not know. And uh, thank you for your support by your presence. And as always, thank you for your continued support and consideration of the annual fund. That is what makes today's students get ready to launch into wonderful careers and lifelong passions too. So um, thank you for being present, everyone. Thank, thank you. For having you. Me. And thank you thank for having you so us. Much. Thank you so much for, the, for speaking with me.